Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Loan Officer Wealth Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Johnstone, and we've got a phenomenal episode for you today, which is going to take you into what I believe may be the future of mortgage lending. And uh, we have an incredible guest with us today, uh, Pavan Argawal. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. Appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, so for our listeners, before we dig into technology and, uh, and a lot of some of the really cool stuff that we've got going on, um, could you just give us a little bit about your background? How did you join the mortgage industry and uh, kind of share your story with us? I grew up in the industry um, and I grew up in real estate. My parents were in real estate. My mom was, I think she was at that time, the number one listing agent in the Lakewood Bellflower area. This oh, no the, way. Yeah. Cool. This is in the 70s. This is in the 70s. Yeah. So as, as a kid, I remember eight years old, I used to go farming with her every weekend and I was the mule. So, you know, we, we she'd hang out, hand out these sort of cup holders or whatever, right? In her farm area. Yeah. I, and, and I was the mule that would carry the, the bag. <laughs> but, full of stuff that was that was that was uh you know every saturday was that and every sunday was sitting with 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 them at the open houses right and and helping put up the open house signs helping take them down um, all that stuff so it's like you know i i never got licensed as a realtor uh, i'm a licensed loan officer but i never got licensed as a realtor but i understand real estate inside out i help my uh, mostly like Every time we bought real estate, I was there. I, I, I watched my father, how he evaluated it, how he did the, the rental income return calculations and all that. Um, and I learned how to invest in real estate from him. Wow. And, and what to look for, how to how to look at, he could go, you know, he was so good. He look at a house and he would figure out, like just done quick inspection whether there's a structural problem, whether there's a grading problem, whether there's going to be any, any water issues, you know, all this stuff. I mean, he was just a master at it. Huh. And, and he knew what to buy and what not to buy very quickly. That is amazing. And as a, as a kid growing up, as, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, what an incredible skill set to have, but also, you know, life experience to be able to learn yeah. how to invest. And, you know, yeah. so much of that is missing in the education system right now. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I say is you don't ever really understand real estate unless you've collected rent and posted eviction notices and gone to court and done evictions, right? <laughs> that's that's when you really understand real estate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is so that is so true. And uh, you know, hopefully, I'll uh, I'll teach my kids the investing side, yeah. but uh, as little as possible of the other <laughs> side of it. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and then and then through the '90s, so so my father started the company in 1980. Um, and I worked with them uh, along that journey. Um, through the 90s, I was a loan officer, uh, and my my area was the, uh, the 110 corridor. Um, I don't know, where are you located? Chris? Are you familiar with Southern California? Uh, I am familiar with Southern yeah. California. So my wife and I, we travel there a fair bit, but I'm actually mm-hmm. just north of Toronto. Um, but uh, but every winter, right before the big freeze comes, we tend to uh, we tend to leave. So we'll spend three to four months uh, remote, uh, somewhere warm. And uh, yes. San Diego County has been uh, has been our winter home for uh, for three months, or well, sorry, should, three years in a row. Well, you should make Puerto Rico your winter home. It's closer flight to Toronto. <laughs> Uh, that's that's where I live now. Oh, do you really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, very yeah. cool. So I, a very good friend of mine, Tammy, lives in uh, in Puerto Rico. So uh, we've we've always wanted to go. So let, I'm going to put it on the list. <laughs> yeah, it's it's Puerto Rico is an amazing place. Um, <laughs> you you get you get it's like Hawaii except it's Spanish culture. Um, and all the Spanish, wonderful Spanish food and, and, and everything. It's some of the best surfing in the world is in Puerto Rico. It's the best scuba diving in the world is in Puerto Rico. Wow. You sold me on it. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as I heard surfing, <laughs> I'm in. So for our listeners on the, on the SunWest journey, so you were a loan officer. Now, I believe the title is CEO of SunWest Mortgage Corporate Company. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct, sir. And you've come out with some really incredible technology 
in the last year. So first off, can you explain what empathetic technology is? Well, empathetic technology, I, I think the the best explanation, like I think you saw it firsthand. I was, I was freaking out a little while ago when we were having some technical challenges um, and a human being responded to that. They did a wonderful job. They uh, measured my stress level, right? That's what human beings do, and and they jumped on it and and they straight, straightened out the technical challenges, right? Uh, and and why was I stressed? Because I had a client, a customer, or more forget you know, forget the client, the customer. I had a commitment, right? Okay. I, I committed this time to you, and I wasn't ready, right? And that's how a every loan officer, every realtor feels when they're in front of a customer, and they're, the customer asks them a question and they don't have an answer. Hmm. They don't have the exact answer or the perfect answer or complete answer at that moment, right? That same, I just had that same feeling at the beginning of this call, right? Okay, so what if I could solve that problem for all loan officers and realtors out there? Hmm. Right. So what if, what if what I just experienced, right? A loan officer would never have to experience that ever again. Or a realtor would never have to experience that ever again. That that basically you're you're there facing a customer, you made a commitment, right? I mean I had a commitment to you, I blocked off this time for you. I'm I'm imposing on your time. Um and yet um I wasn't prepared. All right, so now I'm stressed out because I'm wasting your time. All right, so when a loan officer is with the customer and and the customer and the customer is given that loan officer his time and and the the customer expects answers and completeness for that time for that investment he, his return is is an expectation of, of of completeness and accuracy and the first time he asks a question that the loan officer doesn't have a complete answer to right and it's not possible uh, we're human beings. It's not possible for any human beings to have 100% of the answers for every possible scenario. That's where technology comes in. So the technology senses its users' stress levels, right? And its and its users' mood, and responds accordingly. So not only does it have all the answers, right? Because it is technology, so it can have all the answers but it's, it's also cognizant of how you feel and how you're feeling at that moment. And, and, it's, and it's customizing this response accordingly. That's and incredible. That's, yeah, and that's empathetic technology. Yeah. And so is it technology where you, uh, like you're inputting forms and documents and, and all of like your standard application uh, inputs, and then it's figuring out where that borrower fits? Um, yeah, that's one of the many things it can do. Okay. Um, uh, what what it's really designed for is you talk to it in a very natural way, like you would talk. It's kind of like you know in in the eighties, right? When I when I was in the business back then and watching, seeing how how loan officers did it. We had one underwriter. I don't remember her. Her name was D. Had a D, one D E underwriter. Her name was D. <laughs> Okay, and the loan officer would take a loan application, right? It was all paper, right? And, he, and after he take loan off, he come and sit next to D, right? And go through it with her, right? And she tell him what to do and how to do it, and and what other documents to get. And it was that was it. It was one shot, right? One and done, right? Right? And it was it was the best service ever. So, so the the whole point of Morgan is not really, we're not really going forward. We're going back this retro. We're going back to the 80s, back to the way mortgages should be originated, where it was just the, the loan officers, the banker, and the underwriter, and everything, right? Hmm. It's just that everything got so complex in between, and uh, people are trying to scale up to do large amounts of volume with limited number of underwriters, and so you have the current mess that you have today. So, what if? What if you as loan originator had 
had D right next to you all the time, your own personal D. Hmm. Okay, so that when you took the loan application and you, you sat with the borrower and you had those documents, you just gave it to D and, and D said, um, yeah, this works or, or don't forget to ask for, you know, this, this, this. I see a large deposit here, get an explanation on that. Like hmm. what if, what if it happened like that? Right. As opposed to taking the loan application, going through processing, processing reviews, it takes, that takes a couple of days, they stack up the document, then it goes to underwriting, you wait another couple more days, and then underwriting gives you new conditions, and you have to go back to the borrower. Right? So that's the current process. But but today with Morgan, so instead of D, now we have Morgan, you have Morgan right next to you all the time. So you sit down with the borrower, you take the application, you drop the documents, the information into Morgan, and Morgan will tell you, um, you know, really fast. Uh, typically, so any document that you drop into Morgan in one hour um, is going to tell you um, a full analysis of the document. What, like, if you drop in income documents, it's going to tell you what the usable income is, hmm. what the ratios will be, it'll run to you, everything for you within that one hour. Right. And and the goal is by the end of the year, it'll be down to two minutes. So it, Morgan will be faster than D was uh, by the end of the year. That is incredible. Yeah. That's amazing. So is this, I, I mean, ultimately replacing all of the steps in the underwriting process and making that instantaneous? Um, yes. Wow. It's, the simple answer is yes. And we're not, we're not quite there yet. We haven't replaced all the steps yet. Uh, we have, from the loan officer's experience, it'll, it, it it looks that way from the loan officer's the technology masks, masks it. Okay. Um, the technology knows when to bring in a human and when not to. Okay. Right? Um, just like when you order an Uber, you don't really think about the fact that Uber is driven by a human. The right. car is driven by a human. You see it as technology because you hit a button, the car comes, and you go where <laughs> you want to go. Right? Yep. Uh, there's a human assist. Right? Wow. Okay. Same thing with same thing with this technology. You as a, as the end user uh, don't know, don't care at, at to what degree, when, how a human is involved. Right. But a human is a human is involved um, as needed. Right. But that's mass from you. And and our goal is that it be less and less human involvement as the AI gets smarter and smarter. So part of the way it works is is the more you use it, the smarter it gets. Okay. Yeah. So we need we 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 have a big push right now to get more and more people to use it and more and more people to stump it. Ask it a question that that will take a long time. Hmm. You know, by long time, instead of it, you know, maybe it'll take instead of two minutes, it's taking twenty minutes, right. right, to answer, right. But every time, every time there's a question that takes a long time to answer, it's just learned something. Hmm. That's incredible. <laughs> so, so building a platform on artificial intelligence, how? How does that look from your perspective as somebody who's doing project management and you're looking to essentially shorten the underwriting time down to minutes? Like, do you have a development team that you're that you're interfacing with and they're constantly doing inputs and outputs to the AI? Or do you set the AI up and then just consistently feed it information and it kind of figures it out? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So We've been developing this for years, I and mean, uh, dozens of years, not, not, not months, but dozens of years. Uh, so it's been, it's been a long strategic process of collecting data, collecting scenarios. Um, and so we have a massive database of every scenario, every exception, every, every customer complaint, every customer satisfaction every positive review, every negative review, and what happened. We have a team that does a full analysis of what went right, what went wrong. Right? And that's all fed into this massive database. And that's a database that's used as the training engine uh, for Morgan. Okay, so um, so as as time goes on, as scenarios are, as people use it, put more documents in, right? It gets, the database keeps, keeps updating and evolving. And we have, hundreds of engineers that work on this from, you know, from engineers that are dedicated to user interface development to, to backend uh, communications. Uh, there's a complex communication network behind Morgan so that it's scalable to infinite number of users to, um, 
to to data engineers, um, to to rules engineers, and so forth. So there's this, there's a huge network of people that that are devoted to this to to make it all come together. That is incredible. <coughs> I, was, I was fortunate not, uh, enough to meet with a Google engineer one time mm-hmm. who was working on AI, and the way that she explained it to me was that at the very beginning, Google started working with AI, and it was just like, we need to figure out the difference between a cat and a dog. And so we're going to feed this thing 10,000 images of cats and tell it this equals cat. And then we're going to feed it 10,000 images of dogs and say this equals dogs. And then we're going to put in one image and see if it can determine between a cat and a dog. Mm -hmm. Much like you feed a mortgage application into it, you never really know what the nuance is going to be down the line until you get the output back out. But then as soon as it figures out cat versus dog, then you can say, okay, well, let's take a look at cat is now a, I don't know, breed of cat, but like, Mm -hmm. uh, so I know breeds of dogs. So let's say, let's give it a uh, 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 Rottweiler. Mm -hmm. And it can then, you know, here's 10,000 Rottweiler pictures, and then it can identify, okay, this is a dog, but this is also a Rottweiler. Mm -hmm. And it's just gone through the iteration process of learning so many times that now it can tell all of the different types of dogs of all the different types of breeds that are all over the world and all that information. Mm -hmm. So basically you're taking that process, applying it to the mortgage documentation process, and eventually you'll be able to feed in any type of application that comes in the front end and have all of the outputs go where they need to go on the other end. Exactly. And we've been, so, so let me, I'm glad you brought up that cat versus the dog scenario. That's an old, uh, old paradox. Uh, that problem has been, you know, they've been working on that problem since the '80s, maybe the '70s. Really? Uh, yeah. So that's not a new problem. Huh. Okay. Uh, so the the neural net um, technology, the neural net algorithms, have existed, you know, long, long before the '80s. I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, what here it was it was first theorized designed huh. um, so so this is not a new problem that there that that she's talking about it's an old problem that it has but that problem was finally solved recently okay and and so what was the big breakthrough was it a new was it a new algorithm was it new math was it some new science and the answer is no it's the same algorithm right it's the same math that was developed you know, 40 years ago, right, it's still used today. But the big breakthrough was computing power. We yeah. finally have the computing power and the data warehouse capabilities to store all the data and to run uh, and have the computing power to run a, to run a neural net that is, you know, n dimensional, n dimensions deep. Right. Okay. So, you know, the the idea what they tried to do before in the 80s and 90s was try to do this with a a neural net that was, you know, four or five dimensions deep, which just, because that's all the computing power could support back then, right? And it did, wouldn't work. It was, it was flaky, right? It wasn't deep enough. So what they realized was if you make it deep enough, then it works. Hmm. Now, here's the interesting thing is he, uh, because a, a, a neural net is, is really a first order approximation of a human neuron, right? That is, I did not a, know a, that. A, a simple, it's just a very simple first order approximation. It's a linear approximation. Right? Mm-hmm. The, 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 the new, a human neuron can be modeled as a yeah, whatever, 50 order differential equation or something. Um, and, and a single node of a neural net is, is the first order approximation of that. So if you put enough first order approximations, if you put enough linear um, layers, right, and you make it deep enough, then it starts getting really close starts looking very close to a regular to a real neural huh okay just like just like the picture of looking at the screen here right it looks like a nice smooth picture it looks you look, you look great by the way right thank you <laughs> likewise right but if you look very closely it's nothing more than one lots of millions of little pixels right I right, smashed together so so we're able to have this video conference call I mean this technology this theory of image processing that we're doing here. I mean, this existed in the 60s. I mean, Voyager sends images down, right? Voyager was launched when? Right? In the late 60s or something like that, early 70s? I think right? so. Yeah. yeah. Right? It's 
it's sending images from outside of the solar system down to Earth using the same technology, same bases that we're talking to each other right now. Huh. Right. Right. So computer science really hasn't changed a whole lot. That's incredible. Right. It's just processing power has changed. So, and and I this is. <laughs> I, we risk losing the core of our audience here, but I, I do want to dive into the technology aspect of this and stick with us, folks. Um, so when we take this and we apply it to Moore's Law and the fact mm -hmm. that computing power is just con going to continually expand at a greater ratio as time goes on. And I didn't do that justice, but uh, I'm, I'm, you're picking up what I'm putting down. Mm-hmm. Do you think that because that's moving so fast and so quick, now that we've kind of hit quantum computing and we've hit this level of storage and the infrastructure of the internet being able to facilitate larger and larger transactions, do you think that the mortgage process in the next five years, it's gonna make what you're doing a whole lot easier because the AI is able to move that much faster? Um. Yeah, it's interesting about Moore's Law, because that's a whole other topic, because <laughs> uh, I think IBM just announced, I think, one nanometer, two nanometer chips, and so we're down to atomic size gates, so you can't get any smaller. Wow. Uh, and so that means you can't get any faster, right? Okay. So Moore's Law, on one hand, is coming to an end. Uh, and that's why you have disruptive technology like quantum computing and um, and analog processing. Right. So the, the AI chips of the future are not digital; they're analog. Um, and there's a company that's come up with a very innovative way to create neural nets through uh, an analog microchips. It's fascinating. Hmm. Okay. So uh, when you when you make when you do analog uh, chips, then um, you don't have the computing power limitations that you do with digital chips. Okay, so so you can create, you know, 50, 100, 200 layers deep neural net, um, and you'll have instantaneous processing. Um, so um, that's crazy. Because, yeah, it is. It is crazy. So when as and and those and that company has got chips in the market now. Wow. And yes, so it's it's scary stuff. Like that AI will start to you won't be able to tell the difference between that and human yeah. yeah that's <laughs> yeah that's wild so figuring yeah, out a mortgage yeah. application we'll probably get there <laughs> yes yes and, and <laughs> oh i i can tell you that that morgan um you know like 90 oh i mean my own numbers 99.7 percent it figured out wow right that is amazing. 99.7% of the mortgage right. application process. Yes. It can, right. it can yeah. figure yeah. out. Figure it out. Yeah. Because we, we published those numbers for June and July. Right. Jeez. That is right. incredible. Right. The 0.3% the, the, the that it didn't figure out were the ones that it escalated to a human underwriter to a full manual review. Right. And right. so that's, that, that's why we're able to, we're, we're, we have certain current time guarantees that we have to meet mm -hmm. that, that we published. Right. Like one of the things I told you about was, uh, you know, one hour. Any document that you give to Morgan will be reviewed in one hour. Yeah. Uh, another, another turn time guarantee is that any any full loan you give to Morgan will be fully underwritten by no later than 8 a.m. the next morning. Wow. Okay. okay. So so that means like if you meet with the customer in the evening, right? So here's something that you couldn't do in the 80s, like cause loan office in the 80s, and MM. and you know most most borrowers like well, even the 90s when I met. When I met with the customers in the 90s, right? My, my area was that whole 110 corridor, that's Wash, Linwood. Um, and most of my loan apps would be taken from like six in the evening to 10 at night. Yeah. Right. Um, so, and, you know, you'd, you'd sit across the kitchen table, you take a loan application, collect all the information, right? But I wished at that time I had D next to me. Right, at, at six in the evening, seven in the evening, eight in the evening, right? Yeah. To get, to get the approval on the spot. 
Okay, but with Morgan now at your fingertips, you sit across the kitchen table at seven in the evening with your customer, right? You get the information, you get the documents, you drop it into, you drop into Morgan, and uh, you're guaranteed that before you wake up or before breakfast, at least, depending on what time you wake up, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how many drinks you had that night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so before 8 a.m., you're going to get your full full loan approval, full that conditional approval. Incredible. Right. Right. And so that's the current turn time that we're guaranteeing. And we're going to have that down to two hours um, within the next few months. Amazing. Now, yeah. in a lot of the documentation that I read, it mentions that it is NFT and, and blockchain based. So for our listeners, can you like, how are you utilizing NFTs throughout this process and, and building on the blockchain? I mean, many people, that'll be a brand new concept to them. Uh, can you start to unpack just a little bit about how you're leveraging the blockchain and NFTs in order to make this happen? Uh, that's an excellent question. So first of all, if you go on our YouTube channel, um, there's a playlist called Game On. Okay. Um, and in there, there's a 30 minute video where we actually walk through a real life scenario of uh, reasoning a loan on the blockchain and using NFTs to, in the loan purchase in the property purchase process. So to get an in-depth view, you can watch that video and it goes to step by step how that how that works. Um, so in, in a high level, what the NFT blockchain process does is because our approvals are so fast, and they're automated and they, that means they're guaranteed. Okay, so so when we issue, when we so when Morgan reviews a document and says, this is the income or, or this document satisfies this condition or whatever, right? Uh, we stand behind it. So we reference warrant that. So we reference warrant everything Morgan tells you. And there's thousands of loans, thousands of thousands of loans that we've been through. Uh, I think since, you know, three, since the past three and a half years, um, that we've uh, uh, had Morgan, we've only had to scratch and dent about three loans because of mistakes by Morgan. Wow. And we, we hardly scratch and dent any loans. Uh, we have very, very, very few issues with repurchase and things like that. Um, and uh, we, when we tra traced it back, <coughs> there was only three loans and, and tens of thousands of loans. That is incredible. So, yeah, so that's why we're able to issue the warranty. Um, that's why we're able to issue the warranty on Morgan that if it gives you an answer, it's final and we stand behind it because it's got the track record. Hmm. So, so because of that, um, so when Morgan gives you that conditional approval by 8 a.m., right, it can generate an NFT also at the same time. Hmm. Okay, now that, now that approval, that NFT is meaningful because there's real money behind it. This is not like a board ape where it's just like funny money, right? So because yeah. somebody's willing to pay for it, it, it has, you know, intrinsic value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but th this NFT has real value, right? Because because it's it's you can uh, a buyer can turn around and 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 buy a house with it because there's real money. There's there's a real company, big company, with pockets guaranteeing it, right? And the seller uh, can see, as on the blockchain, the seller can see transparently whether he's committed that NFT anywhere else. Right. So a lot of the risk, hmm. a lot of the risk in a, in a in a home purchase transaction, right? That what realtors spend a lot of time managing expectations on, saying, "Oh yeah, okay, this buyer's okay. He's not he's not going to mess with you." And same thing, the buyers like worry that is the seller okay? Is he accepting multiple offers? You know, you know, so, uh, so all of those kind of risks and, and, and trust issues, right? But the blockchain solves the trust problem between two properties. All of those trust problems are solved by putting the NFT in the blockchain and then the, the, um, the, uh, the seller and the buyer, uh, not, not having to second guess each other. Okay, so you mm -hmm. could so we issue the NFT. You can buy the house with the NFT. The seller knows if the buyer has double committed because it's 
basically the buyer won't be able to double commit, right? And the buyer knows if the seller has double committed, hmm. right? And so that that whole trust process is removed. Uh, the whole trust questions are removed, and your transactions become simpler. But if you're a seller and you have a choice between a say a cash offer um, from a customer that you don't know, from a buyer that you don't know, and you have to say the realtor saying, "Trust me, he really does have the money." Right, because he can show you bank statements with money in it, and it could be borrowed money, it could be gone tomorrow. You, you, you don't, as a seller, you don't have the time to do the diligence to see is this really his bank account, all this stuff, right? But with NFT, that, that's backed by SunWest or, or any other bank that's on our uh, on our network, and we're adding uh, uh, our goal is to add 400 banks through this network uh, in the next 12 months, and wow. so. Right, so the so the NFT would be backed by any one of the banks. Right, so our job would be issue the NFT, and any bank can can you can cash it in with any of the banks on that. Huh. Okay. So the seller's got a, a massive assurance. Like this is this is going this is real money. This is going this is going to close. Right, it's not going to change. It's committed. So even though it's a traditional financing deal, it's as good as a cash offer because it's underwritten almost in real time yes. by the bank almost as soon as the mortgage application is submitted. Exactly. Right. It's, it's near real time underwriting. We call it, you know, we trademarked it, called it instant underwriting. From the seller's perspective, from the realtor's perspective and from the loan officer's perspective, it, relative to what happens today, it is real time underwriting, right? It, it yeah. feels instantaneous, right? And, and, you're, and it's on the blockchain, so you know it's secure. So there's, you can't monkey with something when it's on the blockchain. There's no yep. fraud. Uh, and and once the seller accepts the token, it's his, right? Along with the token, he accepts the earnest money deposit. So that's just, that's that's maintained in the token as well, right? Okay. So and that's a whole other. And and if you watch the game on uh, channel, it ex and we walk through the whole thing of how the token itself manages the earnest money deposit. Hmm. Uh, and it takes away some anxiety of the buyer as well, right? Now I just I just bought a condo uh, for my daughter, right? And I had to put a hundred thousand dollars money deposit. Okay. And so and I'm sitting here scratching my head like, okay, I, I wrote a check, hundred thousand dollars payable to this realtor. And I'm like, I don't know the net worth of this realtor. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this hundred thousand dollars. This hundred thousand dollars money deposit could be more than what this guy's worth, right? Right, but you yeah. know, you just you just take the leap of faith and and you do it, right? Yep. And, and and thankfully, you know, but but this is all anxiety, it's all stress that parties go through, right? Yeah. And I'm I'm experienced. I'm in the industry. I'm in a lot of real estate, right? And I feel felt anxious while writing that check. Mm -hmm. Imagine a first time home buyer, you know, even on a say an FHA transaction who spent three years saving up $10,000, right, to buy a house, right, and is writing a $5,000 earnest money deposit check to um, to a real estate agent. Yeah. Right? That's that's 50% of his life savings. Yeah. Right? Imagine the anxiety he's feeling. I'm, I'm feeling anxious over $100,000. It's a lot of money, but for me, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not half my life savings. I can tell you that for sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so I'm feeling anxious over a hundred thousand uh, dollars. And can you imagine somebody who's feeling anxious over, over half his life savings? Yeah. Right. Now, what if that anxiety could, if, if you eliminate anxiety from, from the real estate process, um, how much easier, like it just, the whole thing becomes. Yes. Right? Right. Yep. And so, so, and the way you eliminate anxiety is is two front trust. Blockchain solves most of the trust problems, and and second is communication transparency. Yeah. And again, blockchain and AI solves that because Morgan is is available to everybody. You can go in and check the status and see what's going on. You can just talk to it. It's so easy to use, right? If you know how to text message, you can use Morgan. Wow, that's incredible. So. Pavan, thank you for being so generous with your time. Yeah. Um, I do have I do have one last question, if I may mm -hmm. sneak it in. Yeah, sure. So, 
we're seeing tokenization, NFTs, and putting blockchain one side of the transaction. The buyer coming in and making sure that we can, we can go to the seller and say, hey, this is backed by this NFT, by SunWest, you're good to go to accept this offer. What about the other side of the transaction? Are you seeing any other vendors out there? Or are you looking at the tokenization of the actual asset? So in the future, real estate can be done by tokenizing the actual asset and using that to transact. Oh, you mean tokenizing the security instrument? Yeah, like the house. Uh, um, you see, yeah, that's a good question. And I'm not, I see a, um, I see a market for that, but I don't see, I don't see a very big market for it. Hmm. And let me tell you why, because that problem has already been solved, right? Your house is already tokenized. I mean, uh -huh. the Egyptians, ancient Egyptians did it, you know, 4,000 years ago on papyrus leaves, right? I mean, that's, that's where our whole idea of security instruments today come from and deeds come from, right? Deeds, yeah. Uh, and the pharaohs kept these, these things on papyrus leaves and kept track of, of, of who owned what. Huh. Quadrant, right? Off the Nile, after each flood, you went to the pharaoh's um, library and you got to see who owned what. Hmm. Right? They, they invented the process. And, and today's, you know, plot maps and, and securities, um, security instrument and deeds, right? It's the same thing, right? It's just, it's kept on paper. So now you, it's kept on paper and then it's digitized and now it's stored on, on central database servers of different county recorders, right? So by putting on the blockchain, you know, all that you really solve is the problem like that happened in New Orleans a couple of years ago. I don't know if you remember that, where their servers crashed and there was no backups. No. Yeah. Yeah. I did yeah. not hear about that. Yeah, that was, that was a few years ago. There, there was no backups of their recording. Of their recordings. <laughs> so they had it on one server and then the hard drive crashed. Right? <laughs> That's a bad they, day. Yeah. <laughs> right? So the blockchain would solve that problem. Okay. But that's, you know, it's one county... Uh, one jurisdiction in the country at one time, and yeah. and I don't, I just, I just don't see it being a big enough problem, yeah, to to solve through the blockchain. And then, and as far as keeping track of mortgages and who owns the mortgage and and so forth, right? There's already something out there called MERS, the Mortgage Electronic Recording System, yeah, right. And it's and it's fairly inexpensive, right? And it's like seven, ten dollars a transaction, hmm. right? I mean, putting on the blockchain, is it going to get the cost down any lower? I, I don't think so. You know, even right. even if you do proof of stake based, based uh, blockchains, I mean, you know, you can get marginally lower than $7, but what's the point? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yep. Yeah. You see, let's say, let's say you got from seven to $5. Okay. So $2 is, yeah. So you know what Merge is going to do? They'll just lower their fee. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because out of that $7. <laughs> Look, let's face it, you know, MERS almost went bankrupt in 2008, right? Wow. Because they got, because of litigation, they got sued, they were challenged over and over and over again. And all the money that they had made up in 2008 was spent in defending those lawsuits. And they defended them now that they've established that this model of a central uh, or a third party holding the registration as, as opposed to the county is they've defended it in every jurisdiction in the country and it held. So the money that was paid to MERS was to was paid for that legal victory. Wow. Right? So they invested, the real investment of MERS was not in the database. I mean, yes, that was important. Of course, they made the database. But the real investment that the MERS team did was in the legal investment and establishing the precedents and creating a legal framework so all of this is possible. Wow. Okay, so for now, now MERS makes seven dollars, ten dollars a transaction or whatever, and it, most of that is profit. But I think they've earned it. Yeah. They took that risk. They almost went bankrupt because, and and they took all the bullets and um, uh, you know politicians who I shall not name, attacking them, saying it's their fault for uh, for the mortgage meltdown. Wow. And it really wasn't. All they're just they're just providing a service. Uh, and they and they won all that and they made it through all that. So 
you know, look, I have no stock in words. I, I'm not promoting of them or anything like that. I just think, I just think that, you know, this is, I think it's one of those great American inventions. Yeah. Great American success story that we should be celebrating. Wow. That is fantastic. Well, yeah. but man, again, thank you so much for okay. being on the show. I truly enjoyed our conversation here today. Right. And congratulations on the incredible success and the incredible technology that you are building. It's uh, absolutely phenomenal to watch from the outside and uh, a true pleasure to speak with you today. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Oh, I forgot to ask. If there's people uh-huh. out there that want to get more information about Sunrest uh, or the technology or get a hold of you, what's the best way to reach out? Um, to you could just use the technology yourself to go to usemorgan.com. Perfect. And and you just go there, you hit engage, and you just start talking to it. If you want to talk to me, just go into usemorgan.com and just say, hey, I want to talk to Pavon. And it'll break. <laughs> it'll, it'll Made it easy. Really, made it really <laughs> easy. And if you want to know more about SunWest, just go to swmc.com. Awesome. As and in, we'll have in, all that information in the show notes. Okay. All right. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks again. Thanks, and Chris. Thanks, everybody, for listening.